Morning Vine Church, it's Tyler West. If I haven't got a chance to say hello, you know me. I'm the founder and lead pastor here at the Vine Church, and I'm so excited that this week we get to do church online. Thank you so much for inviting us into your living room, in the coffee shop, into your car, wherever you are today. We're so excited that we get to do church online, and we can't wait to gather back together next week. If I can serve you or pray for you specifically in any way. My contact information is on the screen. If it's a little fuzzy, make sure you high five the creative team uh, each and every week. They do an incredible job of setting this stuff up. So if it's a little fuzzy, I'm so sorry. My my email address is tyler.west at thevine.tv and my personal cell phone number is 864-706-9634. And I'm joining you live from our Thursday night greenhouse gathering set, we come together each and every Thursday night. We take a few Thursdays off throughout the year, but we come together and we have what's called a greenhouse where we believe you always leave better than how you came in. We have great fellowship. We open up the Word of God and, and, and grow in the Lord in there, but more importantly, we have some great Food. So if that's something you're interested in, we would love to invite you. It's not affiliated with any church. It's just a wide open invitation so that we can have church on Thursday nights in what's called the Thursday night greenhouse gathering. And if you just want to come be a part, email us at hello at divine.tv as well as you can reach out to us at 864-580-6698. And really quick before we get started and before we do everything, I just want to say thank you so much for the generous sowers of the Vine Church. God has done some incredible things, and we talk about it every week. I'm, at the Vine Church, we're not going to talk to you about a percentage. We're not going to talk to you about a number. What we believe is we want you to be obedient to what God has called you to do, whatever that may be. So a gift of any amount, whatever God's called you to do, we always say, hey, drop that in the tithe box or, or give electronically. And we just want to say thank you because God has been faithful and he has blessed your obedience. Throughout 2017, we got to launch the Vine Church in October, but because of your generosity and obedience, we've been able to, to help seven local churches around the world, as well as seven gospel-centered nonprofits, and that's only Jesus that we get to do that because He is blessing your obedience, and you know that. We say it all the time, but just in case it's your first time seeing anything about the Vine Church, at the Vine Church... The Vine takes 10% of all tithes and offerings received monthly and gives to the local church around the world. But we don't stop there. We believe you cannot give God enough that we take 5% of all tithes and offerings received monthly and give that to gospel-centered nonprofits around the world. So this year, Vine Church, celebrate. We have got to be a part of seven nonprofits and seven local churches around the world that are spreading the hope of the gospel of Jesus. That's crazy. It's incredible. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your obedience. And I am honored and beyond blessed that I get to lock arms with each and every one of you and do what Jesus is doing in Spartanburg and around the world. Thank you guys for that. So really quick, if you would like to give online, today is thevine.tv slash give. And just a Hopefully you can see that on the screen here, but just a quick reminder, if you're trying to do this for a tax gift, we are a 501c3 organization. Make sure that you get that gift in before January 31st at midnight so that you can apply it to your 2017 taxes. So a gift of any amount, just want to put that out there. Just be obedient to what God's called you to give and just watch him do the work. It's so crazy how faithful each and every one of you have been. And on a side note, our Heart for the House Sewing Day that took place on December the 10th, guys, we were able to see over $10,000 given in that because you were faithful and obedient to what God's called you to do. We've been able to help a family with Christmas. We've been able to help children who couldn't afford lunches in schools. And we've also been able to give to the community at large. And that's because of your faithfulness. So thank you for being obedient and thank you for listening to Jesus and doing what he says. Last little announcement before we get cranking is I would be crazy if I didn't invite you to us being live next week at the Thomas E. Hanna YMCA in downtown Spartanburg. We're starting a brand new series called Selfless. 
And I can't wait. Today we're going to lay the groundwork for that. But we meet each and every Sunday at 10 a.m. at the Thomas E. Hanna YMCA. And if you want to be a part of that, go to thevine.tv. We've got all kinds of information for you. We, we have what to expect when you come in, what we believe, and why we do what we do, and what Jesus has called us to. So if you haven't got to check us out live, I just want to invite you right now. Come hang out with us next Sunday, January the 7th at 10 a.m. as we kick off a brand new series called Selfless. It's going to be awesome. God's got a word for you and I can't wait for all of us to receive it and then go do what Jesus has called us to do. So here's your personal invite. Mark your calendar, put it in your phone, be there 10 a.m. January 7th at the Thomas E. Hanna YMCA. And so guys, this time of year is always crazy. We know that this time of year is resolution time. This is the time of year where we come off a great joyful, fun-filled for some of us. Maybe it wasn't as fun for you, but Christmas is always just awesome. We have this spirit of generosity, this spirit of giving, and we're in a place to where we are ready to make a change. And each and every January, each and every January, we can find ourselves in our New Year's resolution mode, right? Like, let's be real. Whether you follow Jesus or not, whether you whether you've been with him 20 years, 20 minutes, or you're just not quite sure who he is, you still write a New Year's resolution. And the thing that we can get stuck at is the thing that I want to talk about today is maybe this year we really do want to do something different. Maybe this year is the year that we really do want to make a change. But here we are. We're getting ready to write these resolutions, and we see that maybe, maybe we've written the same resolution year after year. So that's what I want to talk about today. So here's where we go. We're going to start with a resolution, though. Right? Here's what I want you to do. If you've got your pen, your Bible, if you're taking notes, I want you to go ahead and write this phrase down and fill in the blank for me. Next year, I hope to... Maybe it's next year I hope to lose weight, or maybe it's next year I hope to be a better husband or a better spouse or a better friend, or next year I hope to get a better job, or next year I hope to be better at finances, next year I hope to eat healthier, next year I hope to do whatever it is, fill in the blank with as many things as you want, because odds are you've probably already done this because it's New Year's resolution time. So next year I hope to fill in the blank. Next year I hope to drink more water, whatever that is. Next year, I hope to. And I'm going to be honest with you. I, I would say you probably said you hope to be better at something next year because that's generally what we write. But I believe that if you wrote something down, you can fit into four different categories that your resolutions always seem to find. The first category, and I'm just going to ask for some crowd participation here. Raise your hand if that's you, just to acknowledge that you fit within one of these four categories. The first category that most people will say their New Year's resolution fits in is physically. If that's you physically, do you hope to be better physically next year? Maybe, maybe you hope to lose weight. Maybe you hope to be a certain dress size or, or, or a certain pants size or a, a certain shirt size or maybe you want to gain extra muscle or, or maybe you want to work out more, maybe you want to eat healthier, but if that's you, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. You can put that down now, but if that's you, you probably have physically, you, want to, you hope to be better next year. The second thing that usually happens and another opportunity or another box that I can put New Year's resolution in is is financially. Most of us would say we hope to be better financially in one way, shape, or form, right? Like we hope to get out of debt or we hope to have no student loans or we, we hope to, to eliminate credit card debt or, or maybe pay off our house or pay off our car or maybe pay off our Christmas gifts or, or maybe we hope to have a better job or we make more money or, or maybe, maybe something along the lines. But financially, if that's you, I would just ask you to raise your hand right quick to acknowledge that that you hope to be better financially next year. You can go ahead and put those down. The third box that I would say that most financial, or, or most, excuse me, New Year's resolutions fit into is relationally. Relationally, if that's you, raise your hand. So if you put, next year I hope to, to not be single, or next year I hope to be married, or, or next year I hope to have a better relationship with my kids, next year I hope to have a better relationship with those that I work with, or next year I hope to have more friends, or, or next year I hope to restore my, my marriage, or, or next year I hope to be a better spouse. If relationally that's you, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand right quick 
to acknowledge that you hope to be better relationally next year. You can go ahead and put those down. And the last category that most New Year's resolutions fit in is spiritually. Spiritually. So if that's you spiritually, you said, I hope to get involved in the community more. I hope to read my Bible more. I hope to serve in church more. I hope to, to maybe give more at church. I, I hope to be a better person for the community. If that's you, I would just ask you to acknowledge your hand. Raise your hand to acknowledge that that's you. And you can go ahead and put those down. And here's the thing about spiritually. A lot of times we, we over-spiritualize, if I could use that word, right? Like spiritually, you may not know who Jesus is. You, you may have followed him for 20 minutes, 20 years, or you're just not quite sure he is. But spiritually, you probably want to be a better person this year. A lot of folks around the world could say that they want to be better spiritually. They want to be at peace. They want to have more joy, like things like that spiritually. So here's what I wanted to share with you. More than likely, you raised your hand to one if not multiple of those things, maybe you raised your hand for all of those things, but I'm pretty sure that next year you would hope to be better because that's what this time of year about. Like, I doubt that you wrote down, next year I hope to gain 50 pounds. <laughs> next year I hope to not have clothes that fit because I've gained so much weight. Next year I hope to, my, to ruin my marriage. Next year I hope that I'm not financially free. Next year I hope that... That spiritually, I, I, I don't go to church and I don't have community. Next year, I hope that all of my relationships are ruined. I very seriously doubt most of you would say that next year, you hope to be worse off than you were this past year. And yet, so many times where we can get stuck is every year we ask for the same thing. And it's because we say the phrase, next year, I hope to. And today, that's what I want to talk to you about. Today, that's what I want to say is, today I want to address the issue with hope. Because if I'm completely honest with you, the problem is where our hope lies. Where we can be stuck is so many times we hope to be better. We hope that things go well. We hope that next year's great. We hope that we're a better person. We hope to get out of debt. We hope to have more friends. We hope to be in shape. We hope to go to the gym. But for some reason on January 1st, we think that our hope is restored, our hope is renewed, and we have a willpower to make a change and we put our hope in ourselves. And here's the thing that I want to tell you today. So many times where we can get stuck is our hope is in the wrong place. And today, that's really, really, really what we're going to unpack because it's a common theme throughout the Bible. And it's a common theme in my life. I can see in my life where I put my hope in myself and my hope and hope alone and things have crashed and burned because of that. Maybe that's where you sit right now. Maybe you can say like, gosh, I, I don't know. God, like, I don't know how 2018 can be better because 2017 was just terrible, terrible, terrible. So if that's you, maybe 2017 was awesome, and you hope that 2018 can be better. But I want to unpack for us the issue with hope today. So as you get ready, go ahead and get your Bible. If you, if you don't have it, get your notes out. Maybe you, you have the Bible app on your phone, or you can thumb there. We're about to dive into God's Word, and really, really quickly, right quick, I'm going to take a pause. If you don't have a Bible of your own, I would ask you to join us on January 7th. At the Thomas E. Hanna YMCA, we would love to give you a free Bible. Just come find somebody and say, hey, I don't have a Bible to read. And we would love to give that to you as our gift to you because we believe in you. And we believe that when you dive into God's Word, you're going to grow in Him. It's, it, it, it's impossible not to. So, if you don't have a Bible and you would like one, join us next Sunday at 10 a.m. at the Thomas E. Hanna YMCA. Go to thevine.tv for details for the address. We would love to meet you there. So, the issue with hope, as you're getting ready, go high-five five people, let them know that Happy New Year. I do that. High-five five people, let them know Happy New Year. I don't care where you are. They're probably going to think you're weird, but it's okay. They think I'm weird too. So, I'm, I'm just making that draw off on you. So, go high-five five people and say Happy New Year. So, as we're talking about this thing called hope, I'm going to ask you to turn into your Bible to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. And we're going to be looking at verse 18 through 21. 
And I'm just going to read this aloud, and I'm going to tell you, I might tell you to highlight some things in your Bible or circle things in your Bible, and I want to give you freedom to do that. It's totally okay to write in your Bible. I don't know about you, but I like writing in the margins of my Bible. I like circling and highlighting, and a lot of times, I actually, at the beginning of the year, like to buy a new Bible because I've written in the one so much from the year before that I just want to have a fresh new perspective even in the Bible that I get to read. So if that's you today, I would say start off this new year writing in your Bible. Write notes. See what God has for you. Underline things that stick out because it's really cool to look back to see the things that popped out in Scripture. So Romans 4 verse 18 says this, Against all hope, Abraham in hope. So if you've got your Bible, you're highlighting, you can write in your Bible or you're taking notes, I want you to be in a place to where you circle hope here and Abraham in hope. So against all hope, Abraham in hope. Make sure that you circle that and underline that because that's what we're going to unpack again today is this thing called hope. Believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it has been said, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but he was strengthened in his faith, faith excuse me, and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. So Abraham here is in Romans. Like If we were to go in Hebrews and read about the, 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 the faith hall of fame, Abraham is what we call the father of faith. Maybe, maybe you grew up and went to vacation Bible school or had backyard Bible club or had Awanas or, or maybe you were just involved in RAs at church or, or someone brought you to church and you sang a song. And I hope that I don't ruin your day by singing this, but it goes like this. Father Abraham had many sons and many sons had Father Abraham. And I am one of them, and so are you. Like, you remember this song? Like, we're just going to, let's just praise the Lord. Like, I don't know if you remember that song. It's stuck in my head. It's going to be stuck in your head the rest of the day. And if you haven't heard it, I might have ruined it for you. So, it's a fun song. It's something that we learned. And as we look at, at Abraham, we see that he is the father of faith. We see this high, exalted guy, this guy that just, God told him he was going to do something. He believed it all the way, so it must have, it's going to happen because God said he was going to do it. And so Abraham's just this esteemed, held in high favor guy. And we say, man, if I could just have faith like that. But see, here's the thing that I know. Abraham didn't always fully believe. Abraham was at a place, just like most of us are in our New Year's resolution, where we hope to be better, but we're at this place where we can be stuck. And there are some things that can weigh down our hope. Like, I want to show you in the Bible where Abraham didn't just say, God said, Hey, you're going to have a son. And Abraham was like, awesome. Yes, it's going to happen tomorrow. See, it took a while. See, God promised Abraham that he would be the father of many nations, which is why we sing that song today. He even brought Abraham out to the night sky years after his promise and said, count the number of stars you see, and that's the number of your offspring. And so Abraham's in this place. God's promised him a son. He's stuck. It's like some of us could be right now. We're stuck going in the new year. And he says, God, you've promised me a son, and yet you haven't come through. My wife is upset. She can't get pregnant. We've been trying for years to be pregnant. So here's what we're going to do. I have this maidservant named Hagar. My wife has said that I can get her pregnant. And if you're not going to give me a son, God, I'm going to take matters into my own hands, and I'm going to put my hope in myself, and I'm going to get a son and then you're going to bless him because you promised that I would have a son and I would have many nations come through me. And he has this son called Ishmael. And they name him Ishmael. And what ends up happening is Abraham has his hope in himself. And all of a sudden he's had this son. Ishmael is there and God shows up. And we're going to be in Genesis 17 and we're going to see what God tells Abraham. And we're going to see how Abraham reacts to God's promise coming true. Abraham fell face down. He said to himself, Will a son be... Abraham fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, Will a son be born to a man 100 years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And Abraham said to God, If only Ishmael might live under your blessing. 
Then God said, Yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. So we're going to go back and look at verse 17. Have you ever just felt that way? Like, you know that God's promised you something. You can't see it. You, you look all around you, and all you see is, is, is this thing not happening. And sometimes we just feel like Abraham, don't we? We've put our hope in God, but we haven't seen God come through right now on this one thing that He promised. So we put our hope in ourselves, and we go... And we try to have our own blessing and then expect God to bless it on the, the back end. And then when God says, hey, that thing that I told you I'm going to do, yeah, I'm going to do it now. A lot of times we do what Abraham does. We fall face down, not in worship, but we laugh. And we say, really, God? <laughs> like, no way. Like, I've been trying for years to have this blessing. Like, my wife and I have been trying to have a baby for years, and now all of a sudden you're going to show up. Now that I'm old, I'm 100 years old, she's 90 years old, and I and I, I just I ain't got time for no baby. I already got baby mama drama with Hagar, and now you're going to show up and say that I'm going to have a son? I've already got a son. Why don't you just bless him? His name is Ishmael. Quick side note. The problem in the Middle East right now where Christians and Muslims fight the Islamic faith, where Christians and Islam fight right now, goes back to what Abraham did. When he put his hope in himself, Ishmael was the first son that he had, but the promise of God fell upon Isaac. And so right now where Christians and Muslims fight can be tied all the way back to this. And how it started, this guy highly revered in Romans, this guy that didn't give up on God's promise, we can see in reality it was that he gave up on God's promise. He fell face down and laughed. And the reason that he did is he had an issue with hope. So as all of us start these New Year's resolutions and we go to start this new year off right, I just want us to see where our hope lies. And I want us to talk about some things that may weigh down our hope. That may weigh down our hope. Because you see, here's the thing. Before we get to these three things that can weigh down our hope, Hope and hope alone is hopeless. Like if I can describe hope and hope alone, hope and hope alone is like a fish stuck on the beach, hoping that the tide rolls in so that it can get air, hoping that someone passes on the beach and throws him into the water or her into the water so that it can get air again. And it's just hoping. See, hope and hope alone is hopeless. Hope is always tied to something throughout the entire Bible, throughout my entire life, I can say as a testament, where my hope is tied to has always determined my outcome. Always. And so the thing today when we talk about the issue with hope is I just want you to remember where your hope is tied to. Now let's get back to what we were talking about, the three things that can weigh down our hope. The first thing that can weigh down our hope is this, the facts. The facts. The facts. Because here's the thing. Here's the thing. The fact was Abraham was 100 years old and God promised him a son. The fact was Abraham already had a son. The fact was that Abraham's hope was in himself getting the son, not in following God's plan for him to get a son. The facts were maybe where you sit, you're in debt to your eyeballs and you can't get out. The fact is, maybe you're extremely overweight and you, you're, try, you're not trying to make a change in your diet or your health habits to make a difference. The fact is, maybe you're all alone because you pushed everyone away from you in your relationships. The fact is, all of a sudden, you, you are sitting in a place to where you're one bill away from everything being destroyed. You're one health scare away from everything being done. You're one friend away from being all alone. You're one day away from not reading your Bible. You're one day away from not praying. You're one step away from what seems like utter destruction. That's the fact about maybe where you sit. And that's what Abraham is laughing about. 
The fact is, God, there's no way you can move in my life. The fact is, my hope was in you to do this, but I had to take matters into my own hands because I didn't see you come through. So the facts, God, are weighing down my hope in you because my hope has been found in the facts. And the facts are, it ain't going to happen. Maybe that's where you sit today. And I want to break, I want you to be broken free from that thing that weighs down your hope. Because if you look at the facts, you'll see where your hope lies. And if the facts overwhelm your hope, you'll know that your hope is in the wrong place. That's exactly where Abraham is. The second thing, the second thing that can weigh down our hope is our failures, especially our past failures. Like I look at Abraham's life, like here's the thing about Abraham. God called him a long time ago to follow him into the land that he said he would promise to give his ancestors and that many nations and many people will come into a relationship with God with him. But it was just Abraham and his wife Sarah. At the time, they were called Abram and Sarai. And I look at all their failures and how they went to Egypt and how they had fear in their faith and how, how God just called them from one place to the next. And Abraham can look and it's all a path of destruction. It doesn't seem like a path of blessing. It always seems like it's wilderness. It always seems like God maybe didn't come through on the surface. But when Abraham looks back, he can see God's faithfulness. When we look back at Abraham's story, we can see God's faithfulness. And maybe that's where we are. We look at our past failures. Like we look at Abraham and his past is tied to his fact. His past is our failures to have a son for multiple years, God, it's not going to allow us to produce a son. We've been there, we've tried that, we've done that, and it ain't happening. So our hope is in our facts, and it's tied to that. And so our failures say that, God, you can't move because I've failed too much. There's absolutely no way that you can move, God, because my failures make me not good enough. My failures in my weight habits and my eating habits make me not good enough. My failures in my debt, God, you can't move in that because I've failed in that constantly in the past. There's no way that I'm going to change it going forward. My failures in my relationship, I've learned nothing from it, God. There's no way that I'm going to move forward with that. My failures in not spending time with you, God, says that I can't ever spend time with you because you probably hate me. There's no way that you are going to come through. And I want to tell you the issue with your hope there is you put your hope in your failures instead of the hope in the restoration of what only God can bring. And the issue with hope, especially when we get to this time of the year, is our hope can be tied to our facts and our failures that we miss out on the hope of God's promise. And so as you are writing these New Year's resolutions, as you are saying next year I hope to be better than, I just don't want you to look back at your failures and that be the only reason you have hope for something. See, the failure of Abraham taking a son into his own hands is what he throws back at God and says, if you would only bless Ishmael, I won't have to go through all this again. And God says, I want to promise you with a blessing that is Isaac. And so today, God's telling you to look past your failures, look past your facts, and He wants to bless you. The thing is, will you put your hope in the right place? The third thing that can weigh down our hope is this, our feelings. Our feelings. Sometimes, we just don't feel like having our hope in the right place. Prime example, you know, the gym this time of the year can be really crazy busy, right? Like, it can be extremely packed on January 1st. Like, when January 2nd, the first week of January, you can't, like, that first Monday after New Year's, which is National Bench Day, like, you're benching, like, it's when you bench, right? Like, that is the day where, where it's so full, you can't breathe. Like, the gyms are so packed. You can't do anything. Everyone's got a resolution. Like they're going to do great things. Like they're going to work out and they're going to be different this year, right? Well, let me ask you this in your experience. What does March 1st look like? You can see a tumbleweed in the gym, right? Like that Monday when you go to bench press weights, like National Bench Press Day being on Mondays, when you go to do that, it's really empty. There's open barbells everywhere. Like you have a problem finding someone to spot you because it's so empty. And the difference is what ends up happening is, you know, the weather starts to change a little bit. It's a little bit prettier outside. Maybe it's 15 degrees outside, kind of like the weather right now. And that bed just feels so warm at 530 in the morning. Who wants to go to the gym, right? 
So many times that shows us where our true hope lies. Maybe that's where you feel in your bills. Maybe you're, maybe you're in financially, you're in a struggle. Like every time you feel like you're making headway, it feels like you're making headway, and then all of a sudden something hits, and you're like, God, this isn't going to work out. I don't feel like doing this budget anymore. I want to be with my friends. I would rather eat out five nights a week than eat at home because I care about the people in my life. But at the same time, the people in your life care about you more than you eating out with them all the time. And so all of a sudden, you look and the bills start packing up. And you try the top ramen for a month. Or, or you try the budgeting. You try to make the grocery list. You try to coupon for a little while. And it just gets hard. And you don't feel like it's worth it. Because you can't see the result. All you see is everything that you're missing out on. It's kind of where Abraham feels right here. God, all I saw was everything I missed out on. So I had a son named Ishmael. And you're going to come to me and tell me that I'm going to have a son named Isaac now? Are you crazy? Like, no way. I don't feel like having a son right now. I feel like a 100-year-old man. I feel like my wife is 90 years old. And I feel like we're not going to be able to have a son. You know, I attacked two of those things. Let me knock out the other two. Maybe you feel like your relationship with your spouse is, is ending. You're one fight away from it being over. And you don't feel like fighting to pursue your wife, or you don't feel like fighting to pursue your husband, or you don't feel like fighting to pursue your spouse, because it seems like a dead end. Abraham was there. But God's promise was true. Isaac did come, and his blessing came to the nations. And what I want to encourage you with today is to say this. If you know what your hope is tied to, you'll definitely come out on the other side blessed. But if your hope is tied to you, you're always going to get stuck in your feelings. Maybe, maybe that relationship ended this past year. Maybe 2017 was the year of the divorce. And you feel, you feel like a failure. And the fact is, you're alone. And I want to tell you this, don't get stuck in those things. These things will make you miss out on what your hope should be tethered to. Because it's not in the facts of the situation. It's not in the failures of your situation. It's definitely not in your feelings. But maybe this year as you go into 2018, you can see these things weighing down your hope. Maybe spiritually, you're looking for something more. you filled in every gap with the next big thing. And every time you have this emotional high and you feel great and you're so bought into this cause and this purpose and you're ready to go and all of a sudden July 4th hits or all of a sudden the summer hits and the emotional high is gone. The spiritual high that you had is gone and you feel yourself searching for the next big thing. And I will tell you that's where you can see the issue with your hope and where your hope lies is because it's in your feelings. And that's not what Jesus came for you to have. Jesus came for you to be blessed. Just like Abraham is stuck here, God's promise was that the nations would be saved through him. And he's stuck. And he laughs at God. And I can tell you so many times in my life where I get stuck in the facts, I get stuck in my failures, and I get stuck in my feelings as I feel just like Abraham right here in Genesis 17 where I say, God, you're crazy. I'm, I'm way beyond being part of your blessing. There's no way that I can be a part of this. Like, God, God, I, I've tried the marriage route. I've tried the debt-free route. I've tried to read my Bible. I've tried to build relationships with people around me. I've tried working out, and it's just not there. God, there's no way that you can come through. And I will tell you what God's always showed me is where my hope lies will always point me to what he wants me to do. And if my hope lies in the facts of the situation, my hope lies in, how, in my failures of my past, and if my hope lies in my feelings, I will always come up short, and I will always walk in circles, and every January I'll come back to the same place with nothing learned, with my hope in me, and when March 1st comes, it'll be a tumbleweeds of blessing. It will be an empty gym. I won't have any blessing. I will be searching for someone. I will be searching for my blessing instead of seeing where my hope lies. And for you today, that's what I want for you, is to know the issue of where your hope lies. So we've talked about the three things that can weigh down our hope. So let's, let's start to, to put a bow on this sermon and start to, to land the plane. And let's talk about in Hebrews 6 what it says about Abraham. It says this, When God made his promise to Abraham, 
since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying this, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. Yet Abraham only had Ishmael at the time, right? So after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. Now was Abraham waiting patiently? He laughed at God in the time that God said he's going to fulfill his promise. Verse 16 said, People swear by someone greater than themselves, and that the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make an unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, if you've got your Bible, circle that, underline that, believe that because it's truth. God cannot lie who have fled to take hold <clears throat> of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever and the order of Melchizedek. Let me unpack that for you, because I know that can be crazy, and I know that can be a lot to take in. <laughs> because we're talking about hope, and it can get really confusing, I know. That whole verse tells about God's plan for each and every one of us. That whole verse is explaining what our hope is tethered to. I got to hear a pastor say it this way, and, and, and I love the illustration, and I just want you to go on a journey with me in your mind for a moment. Imagine your life is the sea. The sea can be unpredictable. It can be crazy. It can give you the most beautiful sunsets in the world or the worst disaster of your life, but the sea is always moving, changing. You could go from one port to the next and do it month after month, and it's always different. It's always different. The sea is always changing. So imagine the sea is your life. And imagine your soul is a boat on the sea. It's going through all the changes in life, all the seasons of life, all the things that can, can be thrown at you. And, and it can be tossed to and fro by the waves. It can be peaceful when the sea is peaceful. When life is, is joyful, it can be fun. It can be a moment where you add things to and it can be a moment where you take things out. But... Life is the sea, and the boat is your soul. But here's the thing about the sea. When the seas are rough, you need something holding you steady, firm, and secure. And that is an anchor. Like you would never leave a port without a life vest or an anchor. Because here's the thing. In the rough seas, sometimes you have to be anchored to the sea floor. You've got to be anchored to something so that the boat doesn't get tipped over, so that the boat doesn't flip, so that it's not all along, so that you're not in a disaster situation. You have to have an anchor to hold you. And here's what I want to tell you today. Your hope is in the anchor, and the anchor is Jesus. And the reason this whole verse talks about this and what it means is you're a boat that is your soul, traveling on this sea of life. And somewhere along the way, you're going to get tossed to and fro. The question is, do you put your hope in the oars on the boat? Do you put your hope in the stuff on the boat? Do you put the hope in the boat itself? Or do you have an anchor that's firm and secure that can hold you no matter what life throws at you? Whether it's January 1st, December 31st, July 1st, March 1st, whatever it is, where does your hope lie? And if it's not in Jesus Christ, I'm telling you, this life will throw you overboard. It will destroy your boat. And here's the reason why. Each and every one of us are born into sin. We're born into sin. We are naturally born sinful. Like if you have a two-year-old, you don't have to teach them how to sin. Just say no to a two-year-old and watch what happens. <laughs> That's what sin is. And each and every one of us are born into sin. But here's the thing. Because of that sin, we deserve death. But God loves us enough that He sent His Son, Jesus, to live the life we could never live 
and die the death that we could deserve. But the thing is, He didn't just die the death we deserve. He left an empty tomb so that we can live the life that we get to live today. We don't have to wait to live with Him being our anchor. We don't have to wait for something to come for us to have hope. We don't have to wait for God to come to us and say, I'm going to give you a son to be my promise. He's already given it. And His name is Jesus. And what I want for you today is to understand where your hope lies. Because if your hope is in anything but Jesus, you will be thrown around. You will come back next January. You will write the same thing. And you will find yourself in the same place. And you will put your hope in everything but Him and when you look back on your life, I want to ask you this. Have you ever put your hope in Jesus? Have you? Because if you haven't, today is your day. Because you don't have to do anything to get the hope. He's already gone before us. All you have to do is receive Him as your Lord and Savior. And all that means is He's died the death you deserve and lived the perfect life that none of us deserve, none of us could live, but he didn't stay dead. He loved us enough to leave an empty tomb. If you go to Israel now, you will see an empty tomb. He went before us so that we can have a relationship with the very creator of the universe. And the reason that it matters that we have this hope firm and secure is because life, life will destroy us. Sin will destroy us. And so today, if that's you, and you wrote some things that next year you hope for, I would want you to have your hope in the right place. And so if that's you today, I want to provide an opportunity for you to receive the gift that God has so freely given. And that is to have your hope in Jesus Christ. And it's not the words of this prayer that matters. It's, it's not the things that you're going to do afterwards. It's, it's not the things that, oh my goodness, I've got to work my way to get this. It's simple. You just receive it. And it's to say this. We're about to pray this prayer, and then you're going to pray it out loud. But literally all this prayer is, is, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know that I deserve death. I believe that you died the death for me. And you rose again on the third day. So that I can have life. So that I have hope. So that I have an anchor for my soul. When it all seems crazy and it all is falling apart, my hope is secure because I know, I know that you have me. And so to, right now, we're going to pray that prayer. And if that's you and you would like to put your hope in Jesus, I'm going to ask you to repeat the words of this prayer after me. And it goes like this. Dear Jesus, I believe I'm a sinner. I believe I deserve death for my sins. I believe you lived a life that I couldn't live and died the death that I deserve on the cross. But you loved me enough not to stay dead, but rose again on the third day so that I may have life. Come take over my life. Teach me how to follow you step by step the best way I know how. The rest is of my life. My hope is in you alone, Jesus. Amen. If that's you and that's the first time that you have said Jesus alone is where your hope lies, I would tell you, reach out to me. Reach out to us. Please let us know. We want to celebrate with you. Please come January 7th. Hang out with us. If you can't, shoot me an email, a text. Come reach out to me because we want to be able to walk with you hand in hand as you have found that Jesus is your hope alone. I want to tell you that angels are celebrating. I want to tell you that heaven is rejoicing because you have simply received the hope that only Christ can give. And what I'm going to tell you is I can't promise you tomorrow is going to be great. I can't promise you that 2018 is going to be better than 2017. But what I can promise you is that your hope is secure because you are holding on to the anchor for your soul that is Jesus. So no matter what this life throws at you, you will have peace because you know where your hope lies. You see, right now, some of us might have had that. Some of us do have hope in Jesus. We've had that relationship with Jesus. We've, we've received the gift of salvation that only He can give, and, and, and we're fighting, and we're wrestling with the facts of our situation, our failures of our past, and the feelings that we have right now. And we say, God, how? 
How? My hope is, is next year I hope to be better and, 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 I, and I'm hoping, but God, why am I here right now? Because I'm stuck. And I don't know what to do. And, and I don't have anywhere else to turn. And, and it's, it's, it's the same year after year, God. Like, I don't know what in the world is going on. And I just want to tell you, today is your day. Because I'm going to pray for you here in just a minute, including myself. But I want you to write this phrase down. That's different. That's absolutely different than what you wrote at the beginning. You see, at the beginning you said, next year I hope to. And I want you to scratch that out, X that out, and I want you to put in Christ next year I will be set free financially. In Christ, next year, I will build better relationships. In Christ, next year, I will pursue my wife. I will pursue my husband. I will pursue my spouse. In Christ, next year, I will get physically fit. In Christ, next year, I will be more, I will show up to church more. In Christ, next year, I will serve in the church. In Christ, next year, I will be a part of community inside the church. In Christ, next year, I will give more. In Christ, next year, I will budget more. In Christ, next year, I will do things. And this is what I want to tell you why that's so important. is because you know where your hope lies. And the world is searching for the hope that only you can give. But the thing is, you have to know that in Christ, you can do anything. In Christ, a 100-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman can have a son. In Christ, thousands of years, people searching for hope can be erased and the world can be set free in three days because Jesus died on the cross. He rose again on the third day and the same spirit that he had that raised him from the dead lives inside of you. So instead of hoping in yourself, I want you to hope in Christ alone and know that in Christ next year, you will be set free. Because in 2019, someone's going to come to you in 2035. You write, in Christ, and next year I will be set free financially. And they're going to come find you. And they're going to say, I would not know you if you weren't debt free. I would not know you if you didn't budget. I have a relationship with Christ because you took a stand and said, in Christ, I will. I wouldn't know my spouse better because you said, in Christ, I will. I will pursue my spouse. I will not no longer think about a way out. I will always find a way in. In Christ, I found a way to lose weight. In Christ, I found a way to eat better. The reason that I know you and the reason that I have Christ right now is because you took a stand. And in 2018, you said, in Christ, I will. Not, I hope to. So this year, let this be the year that you break through. Let this be the year of overflow because you know where your hope lies. In Christ alone. Not in the next big thing. Not in the next job. Not in the next person. But instead in Christ alone. And when we all operate in that, it's amazing what He will do. It's amazing what He will do. As we wrap up, as we wrap up this, I just want to say maybe... Maybe you struggle sometimes with this. I do too. But here's what I want for us at the Vine Church. I want us to say, in Christ, we will next year. In Christ next year, I will. And when I came to this verse, it made me think of the Vine Church and what I want the Vine Church to be in 2018. Acts 17, 6 describes it this way. It describes the early church and it says, But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. And Christ, next year, the Vine Church will be the church that's not turned upside down by the world but will be the church that turns the world upside down because we have a hope that is in Christ because we will share Him and we will shout His name to the rooftops. We will be Jesus to every person we encounter, no matter what that looks like. In Christ next year, we will be the church that turns the world upside down. And they will say, these men have caused trouble all over the world, but then when the folks see where our hope lies, they can't help but rejoice and praise and shout and say, look what Jesus did in me. That's what the Vine Church will be. So as I close and I pray over all of us, I'm begging you to remember that in Christ next year, I will. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity for all of us to come together and, 
and even have church online. Thank you for this technology that you allow us to do that. We just do all of this to lift your name up high. Right now, all of us can be stuck in the facts, our failures, and our feelings. So Jesus, we just pray that you would eliminate those things that we hope in that isn't you. You would show our hearts where we are hoping in things that aren't you. And you would reveal that to us and we would lay it at your feet and we would have our hope in you alone. Thank you for letting us live in a time such as this. A time where all of us can come together and lift your name high. Thank you for dying the death that all of us deserve and living a life that none of us could and loving us enough not to stay dead but to leave an empty tomb. Jesus, we love you. We thank you that you let us be a part of your blessing and all that you are doing to join Spartanburg and share the hope of the gospel throughout the world. We can't believe you let us do this. We love you, Lord. We're praying that 2018 is a year of overflow, a year of blessing, and a year of us walking closer with you than we ever have before. We ask all of this in your wonderful and your precious name. We love you, Jesus. Amen.